In October of 2012, the church embraced its first Native American saint, Katiri Tekakwitha. Baptized at 19, she was gone less than five years later. But for those who had known her in her brief existence on earth, and a growing number who felt her presence among them after her death, it was as though her real life had only just begun. In September of 2014, Father Wayne Pacey, Executive Director of the Bureau of Catholic Indian Missions, led what he called a pilgrimage of praise to the places central to her story. A pilgrimage is an occasion to enter into a spiritual journey with Christians throughout the ages. And today we make this pilgrimage as Native Americans and non-Native Americans to take those steps with St. Kateri throughout her time and throughout the ages to come, to be strengthened by the grace of Christ and to continue the message of the gospel. Father Pacey carries on a venerable tradition. Nurturing the faith of Native Americans has been the work of the organization he heads since its inception in 1874, when Civil War hero General Charles Ewing was appointed by Archbishop J. Roosevelt Bailey of Baltimore to defend the church's interest in its missionary work and the rights of Native Americans. Based on its prior missionary work, the church felt justified in operating schools at 34 of the 72 agencies then under government control. But the administration of President Ulysses S. Grant had allotted them only seven. Sensing the need for a priest advisor, Ewing enlisted Father John Baptist Bruyette, whose vast experience among the Native Americans of the Northwest Territories complemented Ewing's fearless courage and honesty. In 1884, the U.S. bishops at their third plenary council in Baltimore confirmed the office of the Catholic Commissioner as an agency of the church and as their official representative with the federal government for Indian affairs. The bishops also signed a petition to the Holy See to initiate the canonization causes for the French Jesuit martyrs of North America and for Kateri Tekakwitha. Father Joseph A. Stefan succeeded Bruyette in 1885. Nicknamed the Fighting Priest because of his fearless defense of Native American interests, Father Stefan literally stepped into the fray in 1890 when he sent Father Francis M. Kraft to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the hope that Kraft's rapport with the Lakota people would help mediate the standoff between the Ghost Dancers and the U.S. Army. But when the Wounded Knee Massacre occurred, Father Kraft was among the Ghost Dancers and was severely wounded. The Linton Collection established by the bishops to support the Bureau's work provided some funding, but for many years it remained small. Help came from an unexpected source. Catherine Mary Drexel was the daughter of wealthy investment banker Francis Drexel. Her entire family were involved in philanthropic projects, founding universities, hospitals, orphanages, and homes for the aged. Traveling in the West in 1884, young Catherine was struck by the plight of Native Americans. Three years later, granted an audience with Pope Leo XIII, she asked him to supply missionaries to the schools her family was financing. The Pope suggested she become a missionary herself. She took him up on it. On February 12, 1891, Drexel professed her first vows as a religious dedicating herself to work among the American Indians and African Americans in the western and southwestern United States. She took the name Mother Catherine and joined by 13 other women, soon established a religious congregation, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Mother Catherine provided the mainstay for much of the Bureau's support to African American and Native American children for over half a century. But not all the heroes and heroines of the movement were non-Native. Native Americans were often the most effective leaders. Nicholas Black Elk had been a revered Lakota medicine man before following his wife into the Catholic faith and becoming a renowned catechist. In a vision, he recounted that he saw the shapes of all things in the spirit, and in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. In succeeding decades, the Bureau worked to regain the Native American community's trust, trust lost during the founding of the country. 
During the bicentennial of the United States, Monsignor Paul A. Lenz became the Bureau's sixth director and was there to gently remind those celebrating of their debt to Native Americans. Vice postulator for the cause of St. Kateri when the process that led to her canonization began, he was named an honorary member of the Lakota tribe and given the name Thundercloud. The National Shrine of Kateri Tekakwitha in Fonda, New York. Father Pacey welcomes the pilgrims to Mass at the shrine as they take their first shaky steps after a long bus ride from Albany. Uppermost in his mind, all of the steps, some giant, some small, that led here, and is the Bureau's current director of the broad shoulders he stands on. For the pilgrims, this was a journey and a search with moral and spiritual significance. It was also a chance to hear about the recent discoveries that reveal more of Katiri's past. Welcome to Cognawaga. The word means by the rapids. Father Mark Steed, the director of the shrine, which is open year-round as well as round the clock, has seen striking examples of devotion to St. Kateri. What's interesting about it is every once in a while you'll find someone like at 2 o'clock in the morning who will drive in, park their car, and go into the candle chapel and allegedly light a candle, say a prayer. One morning I stopped one of the people. I was out there looking at the stars. I'm an astronomer. And uh, I asked him, uh, do you do this often? It's at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said, yes, I, I come by every once in a while. Uh, my wife died recently, and so this is the time I get off work, and I come and pray. Recent archaeology has now verified that Fonda was the site of a Mohawk village, and almost certainly the one where Katiri grew up and was baptized. Father Mark walks from the shrine to the village site almost daily. We're standing now on the uh, site, it's an archaeological site that housed the Mohawk peoples about 400 years ago. And it's quite possible and we believe that uh, St. Gaudalie lived here with them. The Jesuit relations, the writings of the Jesuits have told us and we believe through oral tradition as well that uh, she was baptized at this site on an Easter Sunday. The French would burn this Kateri's third village in 1693, 13 years after her death, just as they had burned her second village in 1666, when she was only 10. It was another hard blow for the girl whose mother and father had been taken from her by smallpox at the age of four, a disease which scarred her for life and impaired her vision. Her name, pronounced in Mohawk Godali, means she who puts things in order an appropriate name for someone so often faced with chaos. Three times a refugee during her pre-conversion life among the Mohawk, the mission she fled to in French territory on the south bank of the St. Lawrence would move four times after she arrived in 1678, newly converted and burning with a passion for Christ. According to Deacon Ron Boyer, she had an immediate impact on the local native population. Each time they would move knowing her sanctity and she was special even to the Mohawk who didn't accept Christianity, she was, she was special. That is why under her tomb, is, you see the top name on there, Gayantanoro. When you translate that into the English language, it means she's special, a lady of quality. You know, someone that's held in high esteem. Father Jacques Monette of the Jesuit archives in Montreal leads us to her tomb. This is uh, St. Catherine's uh, tomb. The, uh, her relics were transferred here in the 1970s, and this is where pilgrims have come for many years, and of course, much more frequently since her canonization. This is not where she was originally buried. It was in a tomb that was just on the edge of the, uh, of the St. Lawrence River, in a, in a very beautiful natural site. If I may be personal, as a little boy, I remember being brought here several times uh, on pilgrimages to the tomb of uh, uh, the Venerable, as she was then, and then Blessed St. Catherine de Capita. Even though Kateri never knew this church, 
It contains something she was very familiar with. This is the very tabernacle before which St. Catrita Cabrita worshipped, and she was inspired by this painting of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, which was a devotion preached by the Jesuits and very popular throughout New France. Not depicted on this painting, but the grandmother of Jesus was Saint Anne, Mary's mother. In a matriarchal society, the grandmother was the important personage, and therefore uh, Saint Anne, who was Jesus' grandmother, uh, became the special patroness of the native people. The grandmother connection brought the pilgrims here to the shrine of Saint Anne de Beaupre, Christ's grandmother, just east of the city of Quebec. Although little is recorded about the life of this Jewish woman, the basilica abounds with imagined scenes of her connection to the Savior. This statue was brought to New France by the first bishop of Quebec, François Xavier de Montmorency Laval, and installed in the first church on this site, built in 1658, when Kateri was no older than the Christ child perched on his grandmother's arm. Saint Anne's raised finger and the attentive face of Jesus seem to indicate the imparting of some grandmotherly wisdom, while in the scene above the main altar, she is giving him a piece of fruit. Throughout history, pilgrims have gone to sacred sites to obtain healing, and many believe that Saint Anne, like Saint Kateri, obtained miracles through their intercession. On the pillars at the front entrance of the cathedral hang the abandoned crutches of the faithful, symbols of hope for renewed strength and gratitude. Throughout their journey, the pilgrims heard stories of miracles. We are at the Shrine of Lady of the Cape. The little church that you see in the back there. Here at Cap de la Madeleine Basilica in Three Rivers, Quebec, an old fur trading stop midway between Quebec and Montreal on the St. Lawrence, pilgrims listened to the legendary miracle of the ice bridge. In 1879, the parish received permission to build a new church, but the stones needed to construct it were on the other side of the St. Lawrence, which, in an unusually mild winter, had failed to freeze over. And he said, you know, Father, uh, there's no hope for ice this winter because this week we start the maple syrup. The sap is coming up in the tree. Next year for your new church, Father. And Father went, did not have time to say a word. He came inside and he knelt down in front of the Blessed Mother and he said, good mother, give me a little way so I can get some stone on the South Shore. And I promise we will give you this little church. That was his prayer. Finally, a thin bridge of ice began to form, and several men of the parish decided to test its strength. But Father told them, 30 feet of water there, man. Or oh, they said, we're not afraid, but they had a good rope around their waist. <laughs> <laughs> so they start to walk, walk, walk. And they went as far as the center of the river, and they came back, and Father told them, uh, we'll, we'll see tomorrow. At midnight, it started to snow, and the next morning when they woke up, it was 20 below zero and five inches of snow. But a young man of 32 years old, a father of three boys, said, I will check the bridge first. And he took his rosary, called his horse, and he started to go on the south shore. And to test the bridge, he placed one ton of stone on, on his sleigh. And he arrived here, and as he passed by, the Angelus was ringing 12. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the second day, 125 horses were going back and forth. Mm -hmm. No one was hurt. No one was injured. Mm -hmm. Although the Ice Bridge Church is no more, a vestige of it remains. Yeah. And this little cross with five pieces, it's a stone that passed over the Ice Bridge in 1879. Inside the cornerstone, there is a tube and with the name of all the men who work for the Basilica and all the employees and all the men who build the Basilica and all the pilgrims that come here.
One of those to touch the cornerstone is Sister Kateri Mitchell of the Sisters of St. Anne. Sister Kateri was instrumental in the story of Jake Finkbonner, the boy whose sudden cure in 2006 led to Kateri's canonization six years later. Sister Kateri had carried her namesake's relic to the bedside of young Jake, as she did in the canonization procession in Rome. Sister Mitchell grew up on the Mohawk Reservation of Aquasasne on the St. Lawrence. Her parents were both Mohawk, making her 200% Native American, as she likes to say. The church behind me is really my roots to Catholicism. I was uh, baptized here and received the sacraments of initiation in this parish. And in the 1700s, a portion of Katiri Tekakwitha's remains were carried to the church here, which later burned down. So part of the saint will always be in the sacred, undisturbed soil of Sister's native village. Across the channel of the St. Lawrence, St. Regis Island, where Sister's grandparents lived. After losing her husband, Grandmother relied on her young son, Sister Katiri's father, to bring her to the mainland to sell her handmade baskets in the local market one of Sister's memories that linger beyond the grasp of the ever-moving water. St. Regis Island is a special place for me, a special place in my heart. Perhaps the pilgrims' most important steps along the path of St. Kateri were taken at the Basilica of Notre Dame de Quebec, which they entered through its recently opened holy door. Their visit was timed to the 350th anniversary of the founding of the Diocese of Quebec. Once considered the mother parish of all Catholic dioceses in Canada and the U.S., it was the largest in the world, stretching from the St. Lawrence River to the Gulf of Mexico. Notre Dame's is one of only seven holy doors in the Catholic world. Four are in Rome, one in France, the other in Spain. It will be open for only one year and then sealed. Holy doors, which are sealed after a jubilee, are only opened once every 25 years. The early history of Notre Dame is linked not only with the development of the church in Canada, but with its culture and institutions. The first bishop of Quebec, Francois de Laval, came with a vision about the way the gospel should be preached in the New World that missionaries must reach out to meet the native people where they were, learn their languages, and respect their customs. Gracing the facade of the cathedral along with Bishop Laval is Saint Marie of the Incarnation, the French nun who brought the Ursuline order to Quebec. She started learning native languages after her arrival in 1639, wrote a French Algonquin dictionary, an Iroquois dictionary, and published a catechism in that language. Seeing that native girls had difficulty studying in a classroom, she held classes outdoors in the monastery garden. Not far from the cathedral is the chapel of the Hotel Dieu, the historic hospital of the city, meaning Hostel of God because it was established and run by Catholic nuns. Hotel Dieu epitomizes the inseparability of physical and spiritual healing. We'll speak to you about Blessed Marie Catherine, Catherine de Saint Augustin, the Augustine sister to which this chapel is dedicated, her relics are. The pilgrims are introduced to perhaps the most venerable of Quebec's pioneering religious, Catherine de Saint Augustin. Born in France in 1632, at the age of 16 she took vows and added Saint Augustine's name. Arriving in Quebec in 1648, the same year as the fearful massacre of Jesuit missionary Jean de Brébeuf and his confrères, also commemorated in this chapel, Catherine joined her Augustinian community already at work. As a nurse, she directed the expansion of the Hotel Dieu. She devoted her life to serving the poor and the sick until her death at the age of 36. She was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1989, the year the Pope visited the Americas and made his famous address to Native Americans, encouraging them to embrace your inalienable human dignity and trust in your own future. 
The pilgrimage of praise concluded fittingly enough with a mass at the Shrine of Our Lady of Martyrs in Orysville, New York, site of Osernanon, the Mohawk village where Father Isaac Jogue's life ended and where Kateri Tekakwitha's life began. On this final day, Sister Kateri Mitchell invited Mohawk elder and close relative Thomas Porter to address the group. And Tom's mom is Mohawk and his father is Mohawk. So he's 200% also. Do to kani ka wana ke ne ka diwi wa he ne ka di hantho ne shamba ya di so la wana su a chini ka we no da da la chini ka di ho da shamba wi ka ka diwi wa he ne ka di hiri wa ne ka ne shamba ya di so first we greet you and welcome you to our land here in the East. When I was growing up as a little boy, our religious leaders from our longhouse and our grandma and all my elders uh, told us that when we are growing, they were to use our language every day not, never to forget our language because the creator, the maker of the universe gave us that language at the beginning of time. Our creator is the one who lives in every living thing, every animal, every bird, every human being. The creator lives in us and you and the tree. So all of life in this universe together is what the Longhouse people says is the creator. Life in its total is our creator. Big, big one. And so our creator has allowed us this beautiful day today. Nice sunshine. And you came from long ways. Big trucks, big airplane, could have had a crash, could have had an accident, could have fell down, could have broke your leg. But no, the Creator cleared the road for you and us. He plowed the road, took everything away so we won't get accident. And He safely guided us here. And so when we look, look at the big group, no crutches, no cast, nobody hurt. And so we send our thank you, our greetings, and our love to our Creator, and our mind is agreed to do that. And it is with that, Creator, help us to see with our eyes, help us to hear with our ears, and help us not to destroy our Mother the Earth and all the sacred thing of life. Help us to live with them. And with that, with this good group, we say thank you that we are still alive, our Creator, and our mind is agreed. And that is the prayer I offer for the humans so that we will always know the holiness of the world we live in. Thank you. In his homily, Father Pacey recalled the account of St. Kateri's confessor and biographer, Father Claude Chauchatier, who wrote that Kateri appeared to him after her death. Father Chauchatier said that he saw her, that he stood there with her for hours after her death. She appeared to him at her gravesite. And this is what he said about St. Kateri as she appeared to him after death. He said, as he stood at her graveside, she appeared to him, and she appeared in Baroque splendor. Can you imagine? He says, as he writes in that book, she appeared in Baroque splendor, and her eyes gazed up to heaven, as if in ecstasy. No doubt in my mind, no doubt in my heart, 
that she was beholding the face of Almighty God, that she was beholding the face of her Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that during this Holy Mass, that we may could always, always, always have a desire to become holy, to be more and more like Christ, to be more and more like our dear sister, St. Catherine. St. Kateri Tekawitha. St. Kateri Tekawitha. St. Kateri Tekawitha. During the pilgrimage, we asked several of the pilgrims what had drawn them to St. Kateri. For Nellie McGill of Arizona, what had started as a story by her grandmother grew stronger when she heard the Pope's 1987 address to Native people in Phoenix, Arizona. Pope John Paul came to Phoenix, Arizona and talked about uh, St. Kateri and also told us as Native people that we are to be able to um, carry on our traditions because that's where, to know where we come from is very important. Keeping our Native traditions as well as practicing the, the Catholic faith. Georgina Roy, director of the Kateri Center of Chicago and a Native Ojibwe, felt the need to tap into the language and culture she had neglected. So I'm asking for prayers to, to uncover the mouths of my people. Teach us to speak again. Help me to teach them. I want my people to speak and to hear what our Creator has given us, words, because the last day of, on earth, we need to greet our Creator, God. And um, Blessed Kateri said, I love you. So in Ojibwe, I'll tell you how to say that. Objig zagen jemnido. Objig zagen jemnido. So this is what Blessed Kateri said. Norina Escalante is brand new in the faith, and it was Kateri's story that drew her to the church. I felt like that was me because I was going through something almost similar to her. And so. I just um, said, okay, I want to be baptized. However, at that time, she was only venerable. So Sister James Marie Hunt, a member of the Penobscot tribe in Maine, had decided on Katiri as her confirmation name, but was told that wasn't possible because Katiri was not yet canonized. Not easily discouraged. I wrote to our bishop. I explained to him why I wanted St. Kateri, at that time, Venerable Kateri, as my confirmation name. He didn't know anything about her. He learned about her through me and through my mother, and he granted me permission to have her name and confirmation. So she's always been a very special person in my life. St. Kateri Tekawitha also wanted to become a religious, and I think that she has a very strong connection to me in my religious vocation. Thank you. Jesuit Father Richard Magner felt Kateri's presence most strongly at the shrine at Fonda, the site of her conversion. touching because I suspected and knew that Kateri herself could have walked through this same path through this forest, sheltered by these beautiful woods along this quiet and peaceful path, and uh, contemplating our Lord's life, contemplating His love, and to be able to actually walk in those footsteps under the same types of trees that she would have walked under as a young woman. Uh, that was just a real grace to, to uh, walk in her footsteps, as it were.